Okay, now uh, we have proved uh, that differentiation is an improperly posed problem. But still you might argue, okay, it's improperly posed uh, as an operator between two function spaces. But finally, when we get down to the computer and do some computations, everything we do is always discretized. So finally, we have operators between finite dimensional vector spaces. Obviously, uh, differentiation is linear. And uh, well, between finite differential uh, vector spaces, um, linear operators are always continuous. So you might argue, okay, so but if we discretize everything, we are uh, we're getting uh, continuous functions. So maybe all problems go away when we just discretize. And uh, let's check that. Uh, and in fact, this is a computation that I always do in numerical analysis. So uh, if you've been to numerical analysis, you'll be familiar with what I'm going to show here. Okay, so uh, instead of computing the real derivative, we are computing some finite difference and uh, we use the formula uh, f of x plus h minus f of x over h for a fixed h is an approximation to the first derivative of x. And the error we make is something like h over two double prime, uh, second derivative of f evaluated at some psi between x and x plus h. And uh, if f is twice differentiable and uh, h is very small, then psi over here will be very close to x. So that will be more or less the uh, second derivative at the point x. Okay, so uh, first, uh, observe, uh, first we observe uh, that uh, for h very small, this discretization error gets small, so it goes to zero with h. So we expect that the smaller we choose h, the better is the approximation of f of x plus h minus f of x over h to f prime of x. Okay, uh, let's test that. And uh, we do that with uh, the sign. And we already assume that f is maybe not given exactly, but there may be a small noise of, on it. Um, and that noise is some random number uh, between minus one, uh, minus epsilon and epsilon. And for the beginning, we set epsilon to zero. So there's no, uh, there's no error. So we get exact, we ex get exact values. We get the sign exactly. And so we are implementing the formula as it is up here. Now, this is finite difference, f of x plus h minus f of x over h and f prime of x, that's the cosine, that's the true solution that we expect. Okay, so uh, we try some values between one and 10 to, minus to, uh, 10 to the minus 20 for h and plot the error that we get. Okay, I still have the wrong one here. And now oh, let me... Okay, this is the double logarithmic plot. So uh, these are the values between one and 10 to the minus 20 over here, um, drawn in a logarithmic fashion. And this is, is the error drawn as from about one to 10 to the minus eight. First, what we see is when we insert a very large h, uh, then of course we get a large error. It's about one, right? And uh, that's clear because uh, if h is large, then this h double uh, h over two double prime of psi of x will be on the order of one or one uh, or one half. So um, this is going to be large. And the smaller I, I choose h, the smaller gets the error gets. And it's quite clear that should be uh, dropping in a linear fashion, and it actually does. Okay, so the error gets smaller. That's nice, and that's exactly what we expect until about 10 to the minus eight. And at the point 10 to the minus eight, something strange happens. If we choose h even smaller than 10 to the minus h, then the error goes up again. So this is not covered by our, form by our formula up here. So if we, uh, if, when we choose h arbitrarily small, the approximation error gets arbitrarily small. So, um, 
what happens? Why is that uh, getting larger? We need to look into that. And um, I can show you that it gets even much worse if we now apply some error. So we assume that f is not given exactly, but uh, we have a distorted version of f, which has an error of a random error of about one to minus eight. So now whenever we evaluate f, we get the sign plus some random number between 10 to the minus eight and minus 10 to the minus eight. Okay, let's check that. We activate this and let's plot it. Plot it. Okay, here's the plot. Again, we are inserting values from 10 to the minus one to 10 to the minus 20. And now something really bad happens because now the, uh, the error that we get drops uh, until about 10 to the minus four and starting at 10 to the minus four, it starts to climb again, but not uh, to about one as we uh, had before, but now the error is up to the 10 to the 11. So when we have error in the data, we get a massive, and, and we use a small h, then we get a very, very ma uh, massive error in the result in this approximation. Of course, this is not at all covered by this approximation over here. So something must happen when we have additional error in that function f. Now let's look into that a little more closely. Now, um, first of all, uh, the, um, the um, thing to notice is, uh, and, and that always happens for inverse or, or improperly posed problems, when we have an improperly posed, posed problem and just discretize it without thinking, then we will get huge errors. And I really mean huge, right? I mean, look at this. The error gets up to 10 to the 11. How uh, can we explain that? Well, our values are not exact. So instead of measuring f, we have some function f tilde of x, which is given as uh, f of x plus some noise of x. Uh, and uh, the noise is, uh, um, is um, the magnitude of the noise is uh, small or equal to epsilon. But it's not at all clear that this n of x over here is differentiable, right? I mean, that's just random noise. So we will, not be, we will not be able to differentiate this. So actually we're trying something that is unsolvable. We are trying to differentiate a function that has a random part and definitely this is not going to work because f tilde is never going to be uh, differentiable. But of course we can forget about this and just say okay we have finite differences. We don't care if that uh, is absolute, is actually correct. So what we're trying, what we're doing is we're trying, we're applying finite differences to this function f tilde. We have something like f tilde of x plus h minus f tilde of x over h minus the true solution uh, f prime of x. And uh, inserting this formula over here and using the formula, the approximation above, we get that this is equal to h over two double prime of xi plus n of x plus h minus n of x over h. Okay, this over here is uh, limited by h over two uh, infinity norm of uh, second derivative. This over here, well, n of x plus h minus n of x, that can be any random numbers. So since n is limited between epsilon and minus epsilon, um, this is limited by two epsilon over h. Okay, now what happens if h is large? Okay, then uh, epsilon over h is no problem, right? Epsilon is probably relatively small. Um, if h is large, then this is going to be a small number. Uh, but then this term over here will get large. So if I choose, for example, h equal to one, then uh, the error of this approximation over here will be on the order of the second derivative divided by two. Um, that's too large. So um, we're tempted to choose h smaller as we did up here. But if h gets small, maybe very small, then this term over here gets small. This was the analysis we did above. But now this term here gets large and it gets extremely large, right? Let's, we, choose, we chose um, h to be something like 10 to the minus 20. Now, if epsilon is 10 to the minus eight, we still, up, uh, we still end up with something like 10 to the minus 12. And uh, you see, well, more or less, this is exactly the, the error that we really had here. 
Okay, so uh, for H too large, the first term gets large, but it's moderately large. For H small, the second term gets unacceptably large. And this is something we always have with uh, inverse problems. We always have some parameter, which we call, here it is a discretization parameter, but we call it a regularization parameter. If we choose it too large, then we are away from the real problem. So we're solving the wrong problem. And so the, uh, the approximation error will somehow be large. On the other hand, if we choose, if we ch uh, choose H to be very, very small, we are very close to the real problem, but the real problem is unsolvable. And this will give more or less a random solution of a random value, which we cannot interpret. And so the, the error curve showing the absolute value of the error will always be something like this, very large for H almost equal to zero, then it will go down, it will have some optimal value, and then it will go up again. And this is something which you should keep in mind. We will often talk about regularization parameters. These need to be, for, ev for every problem, these need to be found as uh, the correct values. If we choose these values too large, then we get large errors. If we choose these regularization parameters too small, then we get extremely bad results. So it's even a little bit better to overestimate the optimal parameter uh, and to be on this branch of the error curve than to be on this one, because if you take this, then you easily come up to 10 to the minus L. Totally unacceptable solutions. Okay, um, the question is now, this is a very uh, simple example. So um, what should we use as the optimal age in this case? Well, a simple idea um, that, that is actually quite often pursued is, um, why don't we choose age such that the two terms that we have here, this one, this, which shouldn't get too large, and this one, uh, which shouldn't get too large, um, why don't we just choose them roughly equal. Now, dropping uh, the f double prime uh, of f, which um, we do not know what, what value it has, or we do for this concrete example, but let's drop it. Um, then uh, uh, we should h choose in such a way that uh, h over 2 should be roughly in the same order as epsilon over h, right? I mean, then the order of magnitude of these two terms are roughly the same, is roughly the same. So what we should do is we should choose h roughly as the square root of epsilon. So uh, in our, uh, and where epsilon is the error magnitude. Now uh, in the error, in our analysis above, epsilon was 10 to the minus eight. Uh, and so the optimal value for h with this very rough analysis would be something like 10 to the minus four. And this is exactly where we have the minimal error over here. So H, this simple thing and simple computation actually gives us the almost correct value for H in, uh, for this example. Now, um, but in the first example that I showed you when I had no error at all, we had set epsilon equal to zero. So why didn't it work there? Well, um, don't forget that uh, when we, um, when we choose epsilon, epsilon equal to zero, we're still not doing absolutely correct computations, but um, we still have the machine precision error when doing any computer uh, computations uh, on uh, this computer. And uh, that error is roughly 10 to the minus 16. So implicitly, we always have an error and that's on the order of 10 to the minus 16 in this case. And uh, so uh, epsilon is not truly zero, even if we set it to zero, but it's in fact something like 10 to the minus 16, taking the square root, that's 10 to the minus eight. And that was exactly the optimal age we had uh, in the first example. So for both examples, so this simple idea gives us the correct regularization or an optimal regularization parameter. Okay, now uh, everything uh, will be done in a more analytical way later. Uh, and I think we'll start now start off with some functional analysis repetition, some functional analysis remarks. <laughs>